Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany on January 31, 2021, are from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The psalm is Psalm 111. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, and the gospel reading is Mark 1, 21 through 28. The exorcism marks, uh, or Jesus' first thing he does in the gospel of Mark. Big deal. Here we yeah, are. Yeah, very big deal. This is coming right out of the gate, going after the forces of evil, or they're yeah. coming after him, maybe. Yeah. Well, that is significant, I'd like note, right? I like to note, I like to note uh, uh, just uh, the setting there um, that he entered the synagogue, that that was where he encountered the man, that it was in the place of worship where he in, encountered the in, unclean spirit. Um, on the Sabbath. We need to, on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Caroline, you were going to say something. I just wanted to set that oh, place up. Well, yeah, the, no, the location is uh, very important. And the I was going to just build off of the fact that, yes, this is uh, Jesus' first public act in uh, the Gospel of Mark. And it is an exorcism. And just to kind of pause there for a minute. And, you know, we're here, we are in Epiphany, and then we're going to be in Lent, and then we get into John, and then we're in John for a while, and then we come back to Mark. But, uh, but as uh, Rolf was saying last week, that we are now, we're getting into this gospel of Mark, and how is it that we are uh, reminded of what's what orients us, us uh, what orients us in this gospel theologically, and uh, and the fact that the very first thing that Jesus does is an exorcism is significant. I mean, when you especially when you think of there are no exorcisms, for example, in the Gospel of John, and so uh, and so what does that mean? And so th this connects to a lot of Mark's themes with regards to crossing of boundaries and borders and. Uh, moving into those spaces and places that it doesn't seem like God belongs, uh, which is which is how the gospel starts in the wilderness and the tearing of the of the heavens. Uh, but I I was also thinking too of of the connection between Jesus' baptism and the exorcism that uh, Jesus is uh, baptized and the Spirit enters into him. He is possessed by the Holy Spirit. And that part of, you know, part of the, the power of the exorcisms uh, in Mark is this, this possibility of this person being possessed by a different spirit. And that spirit is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so Jesus, the spirit enters into him, drives him out into the wilderness. Uh, and now we have, uh, now we have uh, this, this cry for this unclean spirit to come out of of this man so that to what extent he has the possibility of being possessed uh by god's spirit so i that was one connection i made i love that uh and it it it's this it's leaves me with a similar parallel uh that you've just um set up uh caroline there that um that uh being possessed by the spirit of god the holy spirit Jesus doesn't teach like the folks they're used to hearing in this place. Uh, that he teaches with an authority, not like those who were supposed to be in authority. Uh, and it's a difference of hearing the voice of someone who has a title and has authority and a person who is, I'm going to use your word, possessed by the Spirit of God. And that is the authority of their voice. And it's a different word and it is responded to by not just those that are seeking the presence of God, but it is also responded to by the unholy. I think it's, um, it's such an important passage for 
all the reasons that you two have just spoken about. And it's, it, it's, I think it's vital for helping people get a sense for what the problem is in Mark. So if we're going to call Jesus a savior, what does he come to save from? What is he, what's the battle he's come to fight? And that comes to fruition more in Mark chapter three, but you know, epiphany is short. So we won't necessarily get to that, but to really help people get a sense of of what this unclean spirit is and represents and maybe to move people away from some of the more caricatured traditional understandings of, of demons and to, and to think about how this fits a bigger a bigger worldview of things that are beyond people's control but also the things that lead to death there's a, a great new book by matthew Thiessen out called jesus and the forces of death that gets at at this issue particularly around exorcisms and and healings and how the gospels are concerned with issues of purity, um, precisely around the ways in which some so many purity rituals in the first century were meant to guard against death or to, to keep a separation between death. And what does it mean to have forces that work for death? Which becomes so helpful, I think, especially in the middle of a pandemic when, um, what are we at now? I mean, we're, we're headed close to something like one in, 500 people, you know, in the United States, at least, um, uh, and maybe worse, depending upon the projections, um, uh, dying from this. And so, you know, with death in the air, and when we think about what that means for those who continue to go on living, um, right, what are, when we think about the evils that are out there, the forces that God is opposed to, can help a preacher's imagination open up. I'm not sure I'm ready to really lay out all of those things right now, but um, but this is vital stuff to talk about for a, a passage that a lot of people are going to experience as kind of strange or weird or outside of the norm. Um, but to talk about what defiles today or what, what does damage to uh, the image of God in which we're created today. Uh, there's a lot of sermons there. As I said last week, and as Caroline mentioned, um, one of the things I want to press these weeks is um, if the theme verse, if it, even just play with me that I believe the theme verse of the Gospel of Mark is 115, um, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is near, have your mind blown or wrap your mind around it and believe in the good news. And then you're seeing what that looks like in these first stories. What does it look like for the kingdom to break in? Um, here you have uh, an exorcism, it, you know, uh, somebody is being rescued. Now, exorcisms, uh, not some of our audience uh, won't believe literally it, or have no fear of being possessed by an unclean spirit. Others do. But um, for those who don't, um, you can still see this person is being uh, this person is being rescued from an impossible bondage. That is to be possessed by something unclean. You have no power over it. You can't do anything. And we know people like that. Maybe you've been like that, possessed, dominated by an impossible bondage. And especially in the midst of a, a clan, clandemic, clandemic, okay, pandemic, I was trying to, I was leaning with the next word about clean. See, there's also a clandemic going on, but that's another, another podcast. Yeah, that's a good, clam, that's, did you say a clam demic? No, I said clam. Well, oh, I don't know what I said, but I meant to say. <laughs> I wouldn't I was mind a to, clam demic. Okay. I've lost I like clams. Control you totally lost training. it. You blew okay. it. <laughs> so unclean, right? Uh, part of, part of the pandemic is that it is the spreading of an unclean, thing, right? A virus. And so we've had uh, obsession with being clean, like wash your hands, don't catch this unclean thing. And ours is a society in North America that is obsessed with cleanliness. Go to Target um, or whatever uh, super box uh, store you like to shop at, and there are whole aisles of highly perfumed soaps and different types of things to clean every piece of your house and your body. And I, I think we can all really relate to um, 
the sense of what, what is it that makes us unclean? And, and how is the good news that Jesus offers us in baptism um, a cleansing of a different sort? Was that a rhetorical question? Should we go to Deuteronomy? I'd love to go to Deuteronomy. <laughs> Deuteronomy 18. It's a lot here, man. There is a what lot is a here. prophet like Moses? Corey Driver gives some good possibilities. Yeah, Indeed. I mean, obviously from a New Testament perspective, this uh, or first century Judaism perspective, this is one of the passages that people are holding out um, as uh waiting for God to fulfill for their time to raise up a, a prophet like Moses. And so hence you do get this uh, in line with the appearance of Jesus. And that's pretty fitting. Um, it's got a longer history than that. And Corey uh, is helpful there. Um, the, uh, although in, in his, uh, I don't know, Corey, I assume Corey's a him, but Corey might not be. Um, do, do you know? It uh, is. Corey? It is. Okay. A, yes. Okay. It, it, um, sorry, Corey. He is. Um, his pronouns are he. Um, so uh, he starts to lean into it that we need institutions. And at first I was going to go, what institutions? But then he, you know, he was setting up a, a very strong uh, point. The, um, I like one of the things I think is most interesting is for the reference back to um, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. Uh, why do we need prophets? Well, when God spoke to the whole people back at Mount Sinai, if you remember this part of the story, God speaks the Ten Commandments, especially directly to the whole people. And the people go, we don't like it when God talks to us. If we ever hear his voice again, we're going to die. You, Moses, you, just let, let him talk to you because we don't like this. So one of the reasons we need prophets is we don't want to hear from God. Um, and so we need somebody that God will talk to uh, who will bring us the word. Then it turns out we don't like them either because we don't like what God says in the Old Testament, but it's still, there's uh, one of the reasons we need prophets is we don't actually want to hear from God. I think there's just a lot of fun you could have with that. Well, I, you know, one, one thing that was uh, uh, surprising to me in this, uh, in this, passage this year and and particularly around uh recent rhetoric uh partic well in the united states but um all, but globally verse 20 but any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or presumes to speak in my name a word that i have not commanded the prophet to speak the expected line there for me or the way i would hear it is don't believe that prophet and instead, it's that prophet shall die. And that just, that's a, that, that's a really interesting switch for me because, uh, because the, the, yeah, the expectation is, yeah, well, don't believe that prophet. And I wonder how many, how many of us think about what's at stake for, uh, what's at stake for those who claim a kind of um, prophetic word from the Lord uh, do they fear for their <laughs> lives if they're if if they're speaking falsely or if they're if they're speaking uh, not a word from the Lord? And so it was just a it was a it was a I don't necessarily want to put the fear of the Lord in preachers, but it really does make um, and I'm not making that necessarily that connection, but it really does call attention to the responsibility and the accountability of of what does it mean to be a prophet, and, uh, and so that's that's I, I, that was something that I pondered considerably reading that passage this time around. You know, that's right there, and I hadn't I I paid attention to that idea, but didn't catch the difference that you just uh, highlighted, Caroline. Uh, and I I will make that that tie to um, putting a little bit of a fear of those of us who claim to speak in the name of the Lord. And I, I do it for this reason. Um, when I was a child, um, it was it was not a text from Deuteronomy, but it was an Old Testament text. Um, uh, when um, there was a text that when our preacher preached, she highlighted for us 
the importance of speaking truthful what God has said and the responsibility. Uh, and, and I never forgot that. I was probably six or eight and I've never forgotten that. And I think we don't do enough of that, of calling uh, throughout the scriptures. You know, um, you don't want to be called a teacher is in the New Testament, um, uh, in the epistles. Uh, and, and here, um, as you pointed out, um, not a word to the listeners, don't listen, don't believe, but a word to the speaker. This is going to come back on you. This is going to come back on you. Do we read scripture with a heart saying, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight? Uh, so I, I'm going to draw that thread because hearing that as a child shaped me as I prepare to speak today. And I think, I think we rightly need to do that as preachers today. Yeah, I totally agree. Thanks for putting the fear of the Lord back on the table there, Joy. The, the we, so often get, we so often get caught up between true prophecy versus false prophecy. I get this question from students a lot. How do you discern a true prophet from a false prophet? How do all the biblical um, commands about how to do that matter? And it's usually, you know, someone will die, things won't come true, but. Which is the next was, line, by the way, if you read the next line after Deuteronomy 18, 20, that's the next line. You may say to yourself, how do you recognize a prophet? Well, if, and then it starts into those difficulties. I want to come back to that, but finish your point. I mean, yeah, I th but I think when you think about what does a prophet like Moses look like, it's, it's Moses was a liberator who had words, but he also uh, did stuff and he also led and he put his life on the line quite literally and took risks. So, um, now not all of the prophets that we would consider prophets in the Old Testament necessarily proclaimed liberation, but they all seem to understand themselves as being, as playing a role in God's liberative work in some way, shape, or form, even if that meant the judgment that comes before, right, or the, or the, the prophecy. But, so there is a sense in which, instead of worrying about, you know, is prophecy true versus false, I would want to say, is prophecy liberative or is it not? Um, and again, you need a long view for that. But is it also active and engaged? Is it is it somebody who has more than ideas and words and and a, and a fiery or, or charismatic temperament, but who actually puts themselves in that place, uh, like Moses did? And I think from our perspective, certainly as Jesus does, whether in his obedience or in his risk or in his solidarity. Um, I, I, I want to stick with the question even though I think you were kind of saying, don't worry about it. Um, that the, if you keep reading the very next line, right, is, well, how can we recognize such a prophet? Which takes up a, a, a big biblical theme of how do you recognize a prophet? And the thing is, it's never just one criterion. If you read richly throughout Deuteronomy, this is a problem they worried about quite a bit. Um, and there's multiple criteria it's not just one thing, but one thing is, uh, a couple of things are, um, if, if someone speaks in the name of another God, okay, that makes them a false prophet, but if they speak falsely or what they speak turns out to be false in the name of the Lord, then they're not a prophet. I like the liberative element. Moses was the lawgiver. Uh, my brother, uh, I mean, uh, preeminently as a prophet, he is the lawgiver. So it has to do with interpreting the law but also the story, I mean, the Torah broadly. My brother has a, a dog that he named Moses, um, who I always refer to as the lawgiver. Uh, and uh, he's such the preeminent lawgiver fact that in the Jewish um, Halakha versus the Haggadah, Moses is mentioned so often in the um, Halakha that then the Talmud never once mentions him in the Haggadah, you know, which is sort of like a, Okay, we're okay. You got your okay, just go away for a while. Um, so it's really to me the interesting thing is as we think about today, who are I mean, I, I do think in some ways we have true preachers and false preachers today, and the and uh, 
I really like what you said about not being charismatic. Moses apparently was not charismatic. That's why he needed his brother, Aaron, because um, he wasn't, but he spoke for the Lord. All right, that's uh, kind of a not preachable moment to end that conversation on, but it's better than that prophet shall die. I kind of like that line. So. <laughs> you like that line? I, I do. Like yeah. These days, I'm going to definitely like that line. I really like Psalm 111. Say more. Well, it's short, which I appreciate. And it has a lot of themes from other Psalms. So I figure I can read this Psalm and then I'm good. I don't have to read a lot of the other ones because it, it pulls in so many other things. It's kind of like, like an abridged version of the Psalter for me. Yeah. And why do you suppose that is? What is it about the Psalm that makes it that way? If you were going to guess. I think that they realized there were some people in ancient Israel who had short attention spans and tended to, their minds tended to wander during worship and they didn't really like singing out loud. And so they said, we should develop a short Psalm for those sinners and let them have this one. And we'll, we'll devote our attention to the Psalm 119s and stuff like that. So I like it. I'm leading the witness here and witness, uh, Luke X joke there, Matt, the, um, if you were going to make something easy to memorize, I'd make it an acrostic, an alphabet You'd make acrostic. it an acrostic psalm, which is what it is, A. And so Psalm 111 and 112 go together. There are two acrostic psalms exactly for what you're right. It's to kind of get, capture the whole psalter. Psalm 111 is, Jim Lindbergh calls it the ABCs of theology. It describes God as uh, Shauna Hannon uh, talks about. It really summarizes God's position, accomplishments, and attributes. And then Psalm 112 is the ABCs of anthropology or of discipleship, I would say, uh, describing the follower of God's position accomplishment. So Psalm 111 is kind of like God's CV, God's yep. resume, like his accomplishment. I like, resume. yeah, it summarizes. I like what I said, it's the short. So of course, we, the next week ought to be Psalm 112, right? Unfortunately, that's not the way they pick Psalms, but that would yeah. be beautiful. That would have been... Yeah, but Shawnee Hannah mentions that. Her, yeah, that's this is God's CV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Well, I, uh, I, you know, I am drawn to the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, just because every time I see that the fear of the Lord, I never know what to me what it means. Um, I mean, I do, but I don't. But I it. It's always a, it's always a good reminder <laughs> of, of sort of where, where is it that I locate or where is it that I think about uh, um, my approach to what I do and, and, and interpreting scripture and how I go about in the, how I go about in the world. Uh, and, and why is it that I share what I do and uh, it, that there's something tied to um, there's something that has to be tied to the awesomeness of God. Otherwise, why, why do I do what I do? So I took that really personally this time. Um, and I, you know, I, as a, as a way to, kind of my own reminding, um, my own reminder of, of uh, going back to, uh, going back to prophet, my own reminder of who am I as a prophet, and not that I'm, I'm not saying that I'm a prophet, but who am I as one who says I speak about godly things and, uh, and claim to have you know, interpretive insights on texts. Uh, well, what, what is it that, what is it that, a, what is a humbling moment in that? <laughs> And it's, and it's this line from the Psalm. Which so, brings up the question about that I have, which is what am I supposed to do with food sacrificed to idols? Nice segue, Rolf. <laughs> if I fear the Lord, what am I supposed to do with this food? Mm. Well, I think uh, I would commend to you Melanie Howard's commentary, which would really, I think, help you with that, which which talks about this whole notion of, of love over knowledge that this is uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a niche issue perhaps uh, in the ancient world and maybe not our issue today. 
Uh, but she talks about what does that really mean to pursue that idea of love over knowledge and the idea of, of building up the community or building up your neighbor, protecting your neighbor, um, even if it violates your own sense of freedom or, or privilege. And I, I really appreciate the, the very end of that commentary, which is historically really rich, but then she moves to COVID and, and talks about... Um, we've had to deal with this, right? We, we know what it means to, to have to make sacrifices in one's own behavior, or one's own freedoms for the sake of somebody else. Or at least we've been told we need to care about that. And um, I get that in some pulpits, that's going to be maybe, a, 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 that's going to poke some people in ways they don't want to be poked, but it's at least a way to open the conversation to say, what's what's different about the way in which we're supposed to live as people called as followers of Christ, but also as people who um, are joining in Christ's own ministry against the forces of death to tie back to, to Mark chapter one. 